Hello, I'm Dr. Tara Palmatier of shrinkformen.com. If you'd like to ask me a question or schedule a session, you can reach me at shrinkformen at gmail.com. The topic of this video is can't stop thinking about the narcissist or borderline or having ruminations after the relationship is over and how that evolves during the grieving process. Who does something like that? How can she say she loves me and wants the relationship to work and then do that? He says he doesn't want a committed relationship but keeps texting. It doesn't make sense. How can she have changed so much? When we first met, she told me I was the most amazing man she's ever known. Now she acts like she can barely tolerate being in the same room with me. How can he go from calling me multiple times a day to not answering my calls at all? I gave her everything she said she wanted, and now she's posting pictures of herself and her new soulmate on Facebook. What did I do wrong? If only I'd gone over there that night. If only I'd been more patient. If only I'd been more understanding of her issues. If only I'd tried harder. Sound familiar? If so, you're not alone. These kinds of thoughts, feelings, self-doubts, self-recriminations, and ruminations are very common after a relationship with a narcissist, borderline, psychopath, histrionic, or other emotional predator. Ruminating is one of the first stages of the healing process, and it's a painful one. Many people get stuck here. It's not only painful for those who are stuck, it's also painful for loved ones to witness. Narcissistic abuse is crazy making. There are more clinical and colorful terms to describe it, but crazy making is the most evocative and accurate. During the devaluation and discard stage, most victims are in a state of shock and awe. Gaslighting and projection condition victims to blame themselves for the narcissist's abuse. You torture yourself trying to figure out what you could have done differently in order not to have lost the narcissist love. You'd do anything to go back to the love bombing or idealization stage when you thought you had an endless supply of the narcissist's seeming unconditional love and admiration. What many victims don't realize is that love bombing is nothing more than a seduction tool used to create an emotional dependency. Some people are relatively immune to love bombing and in fact, find it creepy. Yes, creepy. They experience it as over the top and too much too soon. Then there are people who are especially vulnerable to love bombing, such as the personality disordered and the codependent. I'm not here to help the personality disordered, so let's focus on the codependence. To many codependents, love bombing feels like the unconditional love you didn't get as a child in your family of origin, with the added adult bonus, in many cases, of a lot of sex, at least initially. At long last, it seems as if you've met the woman or man of your dreams who truly appreciates and loves you and they know it within the first 15 minutes of laying eyes on you or swiping right, or is it left? I don't tinder. In reality, it's an instance of the old adage, if someone seems too good to be true, don't believe it. While love bombing feeds the wish to be loved and adored, it's smoke and mirrors, bait and switch. Narcissists give in order to get. It's like a drug dealer giving you a free supply of cocaine. Once you're hooked, you pay and pay and pay, and in essence, become the dealer's B, regardless of your gender. Once the mask is removed and the devaluation begins, many codependents desperately look for ways to return to the love bombing stage. This is often the root of the ceaseless ruminations with which many victims torture themselves while being devalued and discarded post breakup. For a time, you don't understand there's no going back because it was never real in the first place. These ruminations typically occur in stages. Stage one, the land of if only or how to gaslight yourself. Especially effective narcissists condition you to gaslight yourself. After a while, they don't need to project or blame shift. 
You readily take responsibility for things you did and didn't do, real or imagined, without their prompting. Basically, it's just good time management and delegating to subordinates. That's sarcasm. During this stage, you blame yourself for not being able to turn a narcissist or psychopath into a decent, loving human being. If only you were better, more handsome, prettier, thinner, more athletic, more patient, learned not to flinch when abused, understanding of her or his infidelities, younger, taller, shorter, did yoga, texted at 7.05 p.m. instead of 7 p.m., or explained things in a way that he or she could understand, then it'll work. No, it can't. By the way, you shouldn't have to explain how to behave like a decent human being to an adult. Unless she or he was raised by wolves or is a real life version of Jodie Foster's now, they should know that it's wrong to lie, cheat, steal, tantrum, and be a colossal jerk. You're blaming yourself for not being good enough to turn a narcissist into a decent human being. Think about this. I mean, really, really think about this. Would you blame yourself for not being able to change a rattlesnake into a teddy bear? Of course not. If you're a child of abusive parents, you probably developed the magical belief that you could change your parents' behavior if you were good enough, worthy enough, and lovable enough. It's less scary than the reality, which is that mom or dad was an out of control, angry train wreck. As a child, maybe you told yourself that if you made all A's, kept your room clean, explained yourself better, made mom happy, and didn't bother dad after he'd been drinking, that they'd be nicer. Do you see the similarities to the self-blame you've been engaging in with the narcissist? It didn't work your, with your parents, and it isn't going to work now with your adult abuser. What can you do? Reality test, reality test, reality test. Also, go no contact. If you share minor children, go low contact. Just like actual gas poisoning, for example, carbon monoxide, you need to remove yourself from the gas leak or the gaslighting gas bag, as the case may be. It takes time and distance for your head to clear from the fog. That's fear, obligation, and guilt. Challenge your cognitive distortions and self-delusions about how soulmate-y the narcissist is. They're not your soulmate. That's if such a thing as soulmates even exists. The sex probably wasn't as amazing as you tell yourself it was either. Selfish, self-absorbed jerks are typically selfish, self-absorbed lovers. They may howl like Tracy Lords or whomever a current porn star is, don't know, don't watch, but then she's a two-bit lousy actor too. Identify the similarities between the narcissist and your mother and or father. Talk to your friends and tell them what happened. In other words, stop protecting your abuser and allow your support system to help keep you on track. If it's too difficult to keep yourself honest, let your friends or a therapist help you to do so. Stage two, what the, or shock and awe. Now you're moving out of abject despair and heartbreak and feeling the first rumblings of anger. Good, yes, good. You can't bypass the anger that results from narcissistic abuse and do the healing that you need to do. To anyone watching this whose narcissistic or borderline parent made you feel wrong or bad about expressing anger when abused or treated unfairly, it's okay to be angry. It's as useful a human emotion as any other. It means you've been hurt, betrayed, or treated unjustly. You're supposed to be angry when someone repeatedly and unrepentedly treats you like garbage. It can be incredibly difficult to wrap your mind around the crazy, nasty, dishonest, breathtakingly selfish and entitled behavior of abusers. Even when you've experienced it firsthand over and over and over and over, it can still be difficult to grasp. It's not a very intellectually or emotionally satisfying answer but disordered people do disordered things. People lacking empathy and integrity do astonishingly cruel things. 
emotionally immature adult toddlers and teens are pathologically entitled and simply don't think beyond their own wants, needs, and feelings the majority of the time. That's the why. It's just the way it is, and no amount of patience, love, self-sacrifice, unconditional positive regard, or radical acceptance is going to change that. What can you do? Stop doubting what you've observed and experienced with your own eyes and ears. When you find yourself slipping back into the wallowing of stage one, answer the question, who does that? Narcissists, psychopaths, and other abusive personalities that don't give a flying fudge. That's who. Then challenge yourself. Why do you miss and want to be with someone who treated you like that? Stage three, that expletive. Now you're good and angry. Angry at the abuser and angry at yourself. You're angry at the narcissist for all the rotten ways she or he treated you and angry at yourself for either tolerating it or sinking to their level after being provoked. This isn't a pleasant time, but it's a heck of a lot better than stage one and two. You swallowed a lot of poison or abuse. Now you're sucking it out. Think about it. If you eat bad shellfish, it's got to come out one way or the other. It's not pretty and it's not pleasant. When in an abusive relationship, many people learn to stuff their natural emotional responses to the abuse. Narcissists and other abusers don't tolerate being held accountable. They have narcissistic or borderline rage episodes when confronted with their atrocities or gaslight and blame shift, which is crazy making. These painful experiences and memories don't go away just because you ignore or block them from your immediate awareness as they happen. It's safe for these memories and emotions to come to the surface now that you're out of the relationship. Don't worry, you don't have to get stuck here either. As bad or as uncomfortable as it may feel, it's a gift. You're getting the opportunity to do the emotional work now that you didn't or couldn't do then. There's no reason to be afraid. As long as you don't act out inappropriately, the only consequence to this stage is healing. What can you do? Feel your feelings. Be compassionate with yourself. Work at a pace that's comfortable for you. Don't contact the narcissistic ex for closure. I can't think of a single client who's done so that hasn't come to regret it later on. When has your narcissist ever given you anything that benefited you? You have to give it to yourself. Try journaling as a way to take the thoughts and feeling out of yourself and put it into that container. Physical exercise is a good way to release emotions too. Acknowledge just how badly you were treated and do it without making excuses for your abuser. Then let it go. Stage four, health and happiness. You may think of the narcissist from time to time, but it won't pack the same emotional or physical wallop. You'll periodically be reminded of them, but it won't destabilize you like it once did. In fact, you may even have a chuckle at how far away and ridiculous your old life seems to you now. For example, two years after my relationship, excuse me, relationship with my narcissistic ex ended, I was doing my quarterly Costco toilet paper and paper towel run. During checkout, my membership card was declined. My first thought was that it was time to pay the annual dues. No big deal. As it turned out, my ex was the primary membership holder, even though I'd always paid the annual fee, and had booted me off the account to add his new bride, the buck-toothed, mullet-haired, bisexual former child actress, I swear I'm not making this up, with whom he cheated on me. It's funny now. I'm okay. At first, I was mad. It was an unexpected punch to the gut. He'd intruded on my day. There he was where he wasn't supposed to be. I took some deep breaths and thought about it. I remembered the day we enrolled at Costco together. He made a big deal about it, like he was bestowing a special honor and privilege onto me. What was the honor? Well, he sat at home giving himself a Facebook-like bath. I got to drive through ridiculously bad traffic wade through crowds, and wait in long lines for the privilege of purchasing bulk toilet paper for him to wipe his butt. He's a very lucky girl. And then I began laughing. 
full on body shaking, cross my legs so I didn't pee my pants laughing. I may have even snorted. Then I felt exquisite relief and gratitude that that was no longer my life. You may think of the narcissist or borderline from time to time. It's to be expected. If your home was destroyed by a tornado, you'd think about that years later too. However, it doesn't have to hurt you or impact your emotions anymore. You can roll your eyes, laugh, and say to yourself, what in the what was I thinking? And then be on about your day. What can you do? Count your blessings and enjoy your life. You've earned it. Healing means giving yourself the love and acceptance you didn't get as a child or were doled out conditionally based on how well you met your disordered parents' needs. Once that happens, the vulnerability to emotional predators is gone. The next person who tries to love bomb you will be a major turn off, not a turn on. And you'll be in control of your thoughts and feelings instead of at their mercy. Again, I'm Dr. Tara Palmatier of shrinkformen.com. You can reach me at shrinkformen at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.